Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Olivier Morin. He has a full-time tenured research position at the Institut Jean Nico in Paris. He is also a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Geoanthropology in Vienna with the Minds and Traditions Research Group. His work focuses on cultural transmission and touches on the relations between anthropology, psychology and the philosophy of social science. And today we're going to focus mostly on his book, How Traditions Live and Die. So, Dr. Mora, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So let's start perhaps with the definition or at least how you understand it and define it in your book. What is a tradition? Yes, uh, well, to, the, the book is not uh, trying to be original in this area. Traditions as uh, anthropologists and uh, philosophers and, and social scientists generally have used that word for like last few centuries are long-standing practices uh, that um, are relatively widespread inside a society and sometimes even across societies. So the key defining uh, feature of traditions is wide distribution in time and space with a special emphasis on, on time. Now there's been nuances uh, on, on this with some people claiming that traditions can be invented and many are not as ancient as uh, we thought they are. But when, when making that claims, people are usually taking it for granted that the basic expectation about traditions is that they should be uh, long lasting. So that's mm -hmm. the definition I took on board. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, the book is, of course, uh, a lot about cultural transmission, but uh, it seems to be a distinction. There seems to be a distinction between transmission and diffusion, right? So could you tell us about that? Yes. Uh, so I make a distinction between transmission as a low-level mechanism happening between two or three people on the level of the social interaction. So cultural transmission as a social interaction and mm. diffusion, which is a much more macro phenomenon happening on a scale of uh, you know, centuries, uh, uh, geographic areas and so on. Uh, traditions, uh, as I said, are... Um, characterized by a wide distribution, mm -hmm. so in time and space, and that's a diffusion property. Uh, but when we study uh, cultural transmission, increasingly in, in laboratories, increasingly using methods from psychology, what we study are really interactions between two people. So mm -hmm. I make a distinction between these two scales, the scale of transmission and the scale of diffusion, being really careful not to uh, mix claims that are made about diffusion with claims that are made about transmission. Mm -hmm. And what is culture then? And I mean, in this case, culture mm. includes both distribution and transmission, correct? Yeah, it, it includes uh, features of both. So mm. here again, the book is not very original. The, in the last few decades, there's a movement called Cultural Evolution, which the book is both a contribution to and a critic of which has tried to reconceptualize the notion of culture by seeing it as a package of uh, traits that are transmitted and that last uh, and, and get diffused in time and space thanks to transmission. And I more or less take that definition on board. So culture in the book is conceptualized basically as a package of tradition, which is a definition that is at odds with many ways of conceptualizing culture in anthropology, notably, where culture uh, is seen as a much more integrated, much more coherent and meaningful uh, uh, structure that characterizes the, the mental and symbolic life of societies. Uh, the definition that I use is much more minimal, uh, reductive if you wish, uh, but it also has uh, the benefit of being more empirically tractable in, in my view. Mm -hmm. Should we think about culture as a monolith? I mean, is it that when culture is transmitted, it is transmitted with all its different traditions in block? For example, like when we say Western culture or some other culture, I mean, we tend to think that people uh, sort of uh, learn the culture, acquire the culture in block, but is that really the case? <laughs> 
Well, it seems you answered your, your own question. Uh, no, uh, the, uh, in, in fact, the kind of atomistic uh, view of culture that I defend in the book is meant to counter this tendency that we have of thinking of cultures as monolithic walls that people would imbibe uh, at birth uh, in a completely indiscriminate way. Uh, in fact, the way I, I see cultural learning is as a highly discriminative and selective uh, process. So we do not acquire all of our culture, mm. nor do we need to. And uh, yeah, and, and cultures themselves are not completely homogenic inside a given culture. You find lots of discrepancies between individuals, uh, which very often are very difficult to describe in uh, ethnographic or, or, or sociological literature because people are looking for coherent holes, but in fact they do not always find it. And if we describe culture at the individual level, we find that different people will select very different uh, cultural features. So I, the book is in part a plea to consider the, the again, this is not entirely original, I'm not the, the first to, to say it, uh, but taking the, you know, drawing the theoretical consequences of that point of view, uh, leads us to a very different way of looking at cultural transmission. Mm -hmm. But I mean, to study human culture, is it really necessary for us to be able to distinguish between different cultures and trace a precise line between different cultures or something like that? Well, it depends what you want to do. In the, 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 the goal of the book is to explain how traditions live and die. It's to explain why humans, uh, in particular, possess such a large number of long-lasting cultural traits. That is to say, cultural traits that uh, endure through generations and that diffuse widely in, in space. In order to do that, you really don't need to draw sharp boundaries between societies and they say this is culture A, this is culture B. And in fact, it's, it can be detrimental to do so because it prevents us from understanding, for instance, how a cultural trait can diffuse across cultures which is the case for the majority of successful traditions. So, uh, so yeah, the, the holistic uh, view of cultures uh, presented as you know, self-standing uh, uh, separates watertight spheres, which is a bit of a straw man anyway, uh, is definitely not endorsed in the book, and, and I don't think it's needed. Sometimes for some purposes, it can be useful to, to schematize uh, big cultural areas, but even then it comes with risks that uh, some of which I, I described in the book. Mm -hmm. So, what does a quantitative approach to culture bring to the table? Oh, well, uh, lots of things. Uh, this is not actually something that the book insists on very much, mm -hmm. uh, because the book is very theoretical. There's not much uh, uh, that is really quantitative, mm -hmm. uh, in contrast to, to, the, to the work I've done since then. Mm -hmm. But the, yeah, the, 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 the the benefits of a quantitative approach uh, are, f are man manifold, really. Uh, one of them is to be able to really measure uh, the diffusion of, of, of traditions. Uh, uh -huh. So when we say that traditions last for a long time, uh, well, that doesn't mean much unless you quantify how, how long is long. And this is something I tried to do, for instance, uh, concerning children's traditions, so children's folklore is transmitted from child to child, and we know that these traditions can last for a long time. But how long is long, and is it much longer compared to similar adult traditions, is typically a quantitative question. But beyond that, the quantitative toolkit opened up uh, in, in the last few decades by fields like digital humanities, cultural evolution, uh, or, or, or mainstream social science applied to cultural diffusion, has opened up lots and lots of new uh, areas for research which would be a bit, a bit fastidious to list with you. <laughs> sure. Uh, when we find differences between peoples, should we assume that they are always cultural? No. Uh, well, in, in, and in fact, nobody really does that. But there is a tendency in the literature to consider that when you study uh, two populations uh, that can be very remote and, and very different economically, socially, uh, whatever difference you find between the two uh, can be ascribed to a cultural difference. So to take an example, there's this very famous series of experiments uh, 
uh, Economic Games in Cross-Cultural Society by Joe Henry Cadell, that mm -hmm. looks at uh, economic games in different societies. Uh, and that study was, and finds huge discrepancies in the results. And that study was the basis for a series of claims saying that culture drives cooperation. Because these, these people in, in, in these uh, uh, societies act differently, they yeah. cooperate differently, therefore their culture made them do it. Uh, which discounts uh, all manners of concerning factors linked to uh, sociology, demography, uh, you know, economics, and so on. And uh, I, I, I tend to side with researchers like Shakti Lamba and, and Ruth Mathy, who have uh, shown that you can find almost equally uh, important differences inside the same population, mm -hmm. uh, varying you know, lots of different factors uh, that are not culture per se. Now, the, the obvious rejoinder to, say, to that is to say, well, whatever, uh, this is cultural, in, because culture is, a, is a, you know, uh, a vague concept, you can always say that economics is culture, that sociology is culture, and so on. Mm -hmm. But this is not consistent with the view that culture is made of uh, long-lasting traditions uh, that uh, somehow characterize a certain way of life. So uh, if we put an equal sign between culture and everything that is social, or that is environmental, or, or, or that is non-genetic, then yes, any difference between people uh, that you can find that cannot be ascribed to human nature are, are somehow cultural. But that's kind of a cheap uh, definition of culture that I try to uh, push back against in the book and mm -hmm. other places since, since then. Yeah. So let us now talk about some prominent uh, theories of culture and cultural transmission out there. Uh, what do you think about memetics? Well, it's, it's a bit hard to judge memetics because it's not, how shall I put it, it's not really a research program that's alive right now, it's more of a slogan. So the, 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 the idea of memetics was launched by Richard Dawkins, as you know, in, in the mm -hmm. uh, last chapter of Selfish Gene, yep. uh, and then it lay kind of dormant for a decade or so. And while Dawkins was writing, there were lots of people who uh, well, lots of people. There were uh, at least three research teams, you know, Cavalli, Sforza, uh, Langston and Wilson, uh, Boyd and Richardson, who, and, and, and also uh, uh, Dan Sperda, uh, who were trying to uh, conceptualize culture, cultural transmission, drawing inspiration from models in evolutionary biology. Mm -hmm. uh, but mimetics was not part of that endeavor. It was a distant inspiration. It was not an active player. Uh, mm -hmm. It started to become one with the foundation of the Journal of Mimetics, I think in, in the late 90s, yeah. but that was not really a success. There were a couple of interesting books by Robert Unger or Susan Blakemore, uh, but that was that. So judging mimetics in this context is a bit difficult because, and I don't want to be uncharitable, there were lots of worthy contributions from the authors I just cited, but I can't really say it's a major player in, in the field right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, a question that perhaps <coughs> is also at least to some extent related to memetics. Is culture about ideas or mental representations? Mm. Um, that's a tough one. Uh, so uh, when, when we try to study cultural transmission in a quantitative fashion, as uh, looking at culture as a package of traditions, mm -hmm. we need to identify what is the, the smallest unit of culture. So how do you define a cultural unit? Mm -hmm. A recipe, a song, a way of dancing, perhaps a way of shaking hands. These are very elusive uh, objects to study. Mm -hmm. uh, when you study the, the, the distribution of children's rhymes or changing the shape of letters over time or, or artistic style in portrait paintings or, or, or kind of things that, that I, I studied, you always need to ask yourself, well, what is the right level of analysis mm -hmm. to, to study this? And one uh, tempting answer is to say, well, the DNA of culture is information stored in people's heads. Mm -hmm. uh, culture is information, and that's the basic unit we're looking at. And it was, it is a tempting answer still, it's been uh, sometimes put forward by people in the field of cultural evolution, mm 
uh, notably, uh, the slogan being culture is information. And that was really uh, uh, very close to Richard Dawkins' position in, in advocating mimetics. Uh, I don't think it solves the problem. And, and in the book, I distance myself from this view, even though it would solve uh, uh, some of the issues linked to uh, the issue of how to individuate cultural items. I do not think it solves the problem because anthropologists are right that mm. culture is in many ways external to our brains. And this is something that philosophers of cognitive science have uh, also highlighted. Mm. And to, to, to take the classic example from Clifford Geertz, uh, if you take a Bach uh, cantata uh, and you erase all, all external physical manifestations of that cantata and everything that's left is an ID inside a musician's head, then something important will be lost. You know, it's, it's not the Bach cantata cannot be reduced to uh, a, a string of notes uh, inside someone's hands. It, it is a public manifestation. Uh, same for rituals, for instance, which are quintessentially public uh, things. So culture is in many ways external, uh, in many ways public, and we can't really erase that aspect uh, of culture. So Dan Sperber, for instance, uh, who was uh, my uh, PhD advisor, uh, and, and the book is uh, drawn from my PhD series, so he was obviously a, a huge influence and, and still is on my work. Uh, you know, he puts it this way, you have public representations and you have uh, internal representations inside people's heads, and the two interact. Mm -hmm. That's a, 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 a good start uh, in, in, in um, raising the problem. So, to cut it short, I don't think culture can be reduced to information stored uh, and transmitted from one person's head to another person's head. Mm -hmm. So there are many different forms of cultural transmission that anthropologists who study culture talk about, like imitation, learning, communication, yeah. teaching, social influence. Those are some of the ones at least that you talk about in the book. Before we get into which of them and what might be some of the problems with them, tell us about the uh, what you call the wear and tear and the flop problems of cultural transmission? Sure. So when, if you want to transmit a tradition uh, far and wide in time or space, uh, you basically have to solve two problems. Uh, the, the, the first one uh, is what I call the wear and tear problem. So the wear and tear problem is the problem of information loss that occurs during transmission. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, tell me a joke, uh, and I repeat it to a third person, we repeat it to a fourth, and so on and so forth. Uh, there has to be some information that gets lost yeah. uh, in each retelling. And the easiest way to look at that is to play a game of Chinese whispers or telephone, or, you know, it's called by many names. It's yeah. basically a transmission chain where A transmits something to B, transmits something to C, and so on. And the reason the game is fun is that typically in such a linear chain, A, B, C, D, uh, the original content uh, gets distorted beyond recognition after mm -hmm. v very, very few uh, uh, links in the chain. Now, this is something that people studying culture experimentally in the lab have explored uh, almost to the point of saturation, uh, showing that indeed there is information deperdition, and, and, and in a way we've known that since the 1930s. So that's the first problem. Uh, it looks big, but I argue that it's not as important as it seems. The second problem is what I call the flop problem. So the flop problem occurs if you tell me a, a joke, uh, and I'm not going to repeat it, either because I'm lazy or inattentive, or maybe the joke is not that good. You, you know the problem. Uh, the flop problem is, in my view, the, the, the main and most important problem in, in cultural transmission. And the which sounds kind of trivial, but the problem is that most uh, research in the, in the field looking at cultural transmission, the psychology and mm -hmm. comparative uh, 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 psychology and anthropology of cultural transmission has overwhelmingly looked at the first one, the wear and tear problem. Thinking, you know, how can imitation be faithful enough to avoid the loss of information that occurs? How can we make sure that transmission is as faithful as possible and as accurate as possible to avoid that. But that, what I argue is that if you uh, solve the wear and tear problem and you do not solve the flop problem, then you know the, the tradition is dead anyway. Mm 
even if it's face retransmitted from me to you, if I do not retransmit it, it's dead. But if you do solve the flop problem, if I if the joke is excellent and I transmit to many it to many, many people many times, in fact that takes care of the wear and tear problem, because mm-hmm. having multiple people to run from, having many instances of transmission, uh, is a palliative, uh, repairs uh, the unfaithfulness of, trans- of of transmission. So if transmission between two people is not very faithful, it doesn't matter if uh, these people have several people to run from. Mm-hmm. So that, that's the main thesis uh, 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 of that chapter in the book. And I mean, uh, why is it, uh, the, uh, do you have any explanation as to why is it that sometimes people uh, retransmit the information they get? Like, for example, the joke and other times they don't. I mean, does it have anything to do with some of the phenomena identified, for example, by Boyd and Richardson, like, for example, uh, context-dependent biases, content-dependent biases, free, uh, things related to frequency and stuff like that. Yes, well, there, there are lots of ways to uh, look at that issue. So most people who study cultural transmission have identif- have you know, remarked that some uh, cultural content has more potential to spread than others. Mm -hmm. Uh, And as you said, there's uh, two broad ways of looking at it. One is to insist on social contextual factors, like Mm -hmm. how prestigious or frequent are uh, the the models that uh, carry a given cultural traits. That's something that, it has been the dominant way of looking at cultural transmission since uh, Gabriel Tard, who was the first uh, person to study cultural transmission and diffusion seriously mm-hmm. in the early 20th century. And then it, these ideas diffused into social psychology, where ideas like conformity or you know, deference to prestige uh, evolved. That's one way uh, of looking at things. Another way of looking at things is to consider the intrinsic cognitive or uh, psychological appeal yeah. uh, or intrinsic interest of cultural practices, for instance, so a joke can be more or less funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, calling this content bias does not really explain uh, what makes it funny or not. Uh, and in fact, I, I have argued in the book and, and also in follow-ups where I debate Boyd and Richardson's idea that content bias does not quite characterize very well uh, what uh, is important here, but I will leave that aside for the moment. Anyway, so intrinsic content properties of uh, cultural items also matter a lot. So in the book, I uh, criticize the view of cultural success that is based on social contextual factors like prestige or conformity. Mm -hmm. I criticize it because uh, I think it is based on a relatively partial reading of the the literature. So a couple of uh, uh, social psychology results that have been uh, over-interpreted, like Ash's famous conformity experiment, mm-hmm. uh, and, and they do not really translate very well into uh, real control, control transmission data. That's one reason to criticize uh, this view. Another reason to criticize it is, <clears throat> how should I put it, is the, is the fact that conformity and prestige are intrinsically local phenomena. Mm -hmm. So if you conform to the majority, you conform to the majority around you. If you Mm -hmm. conform to the local prestigious person, you conform to the local prestigious person. But what we want to explain is how traditions manage to last uh, through time and diffuse through space. And diffusing not just inside one society, but also across very different societies where majorities might arrive. the, the, the book argues, uh, well, it was actually written 10 years ago so, and, and, and translated in 2016. So at the time, there was less emphasis on the cognitive determinants of, of cultural change. Uh, we want to be totally unfair to the literature because there, there was some, but uh, I really wanted to uh, push a view of cultural success that is not just determined by social factors. It's not just about conformity, it's not just about deference to prestige, it's also about people using their brain to select cultural items that, that matter to them. And since we're already talking about that, I mean, 
is it really that people simply copy information transmitted by prestigious people uh, independently of context and regardless of the specific person that is transmitting it and uh, I mean uh, perhaps the the areas they want to apply that information to so no people do not uh, follow prestige in a mechanical way just identifying someone who is the uh, model the absolute model in all areas and doing exactly what they do uh, it's much more contextual than that and it's much more discriminative than that i i, I think there's broad agreement on that today even though it may not have been the case in the past so one uh, nagging issue for the field is how uh, how specific, how domain specific prestige can be. So if you have a friend who is uh, uh, a board games uh, uh, expert and you defer to them in all matters uh, concerning board games, are you going to uh, follow their choices in, in your dress code or uh, what restaurants to eat at or, 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 and so on? Uh, that, that kind of question is uh, relatively poorly, uh, um, the, the answer is relatively poorly known, but I think what we know uh, points towards a very domain-specific understanding of prestige, which is a problem, I argue, for the prestige view of cultural transmission, because the more domain-specific prestige becomes, the less explanatory it is, because you need to redefine prestige every time. Mm -hmm. uh, the caricature of that is in sociolinguistics, where prestige has been used to explain how accents spread. So for instance, on, on Martha's Vineyard, uh, there, there is a famous study arguing that a certain way of pronouncing words has spread from local fishermen to the rest of the population. Now, uh, as you probably know, Martha's Vineyard is known to be a jet set VRP, uh, VIP uh, kind of island where mm -hmm. uh, you know, the rich and famous reside. So it's kind of funny to to have those local fishermen uh, spread their accents. But the explanation for this, that sociologists will say, well, you know, fishermen are prestigious locally yeah. with respect <laughs> to their accents. Yeah. Uh, which, and and that, that kind of policy, uh, I, I call it a policy because it, it, it becomes uh, completely ad hoc what prestige is. And you can appeal to prestige in more or less any circumstances. That dates back at least to, to, to the days of Gabriel Tart. So, uh, Tad remarked that the Christian religion had progressed from slaves and women to uh, the emperor of, uh, of all the universe. So you, you can't be, you know, you cannot be lower in prestige than the slave uh, uh, or woman slave in, in, in ancient Rome, and you can, can't be higher, of course, than the demigod that's the emperor. But, you know, cultural transmission flowed that way. So how, how come? Well, it's because there was local prestige due to the religious special value of it. So, 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 yeah, the, the kind of uh, ad hocness that I think uh, is plagues the, the 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 explanations of cultural success based on prestige since the beginning. I'm not saying prestige cannot be used in a way that's not circular, but it's it's a risk. Mm -hmm. So another form of cultural transmission that anthropologists refer to, and I mentioned when I introduced this part of the conversation, is teaching. Does it really yes. play an important role in cultural <laughs> transmission? Uh, so teaching is, uh, is a notion that uh, emerges first in a context of comparative psychology where people were asking, do, do non-human animals teach? Uh, and it's still an open case, in fact, uh, whether animals like meerkats uh, uh, teach their young. So teaching in meerkats is alleged to happen because uh, the, the meerkats will give their young uh, weakened sculptures to play with. So they remove the stain uh, or, or, or they just smash them so that they are semi-unconscious and it becomes easier for the, the, the young meerkat to, to play. So that kind of behavior, it, you know, it has elements of intentional cultural transmission, mm -hmm. which, uh, which means the word teaching has been used. Now, it's also used in ethnography in a very, very different way, uh, denoting the, let's say, uh, 
explicit verbal and institutionalized nature of cultural transmission. So, you know, we, we I, you know, I will gather the, a few children of the village around me and I will uh, tell them about such and such a thing that they have to know. Mm -hmm. uh, which, in fact, is, is, is quite rare, uh, that kind of institutionalized explicit uh, uh, cultural transmission. Now, there are lots of ways to define teaching in between these two extremes, and this makes for a very heterogeneous notion, uh, to say the least. That's why I try to uh, uh, cut through the, the misunderstandings that have occurred uh, due to this variety of meanings. What I think really matters for human cultural transmission is ostensive communication. So ostensive communication is a way to transmit information, I did not say cultural, but information that may or may not be cultural, mm -hmm. intentionally, overtly, uh, in a way that is uh, mutually recognized as intentional. So pointing being a, a typical case of that. Uh, I don't think it is specific to culture. So it could be about things that are completely, that are not traditional at all. It could be the location of a bit of food and so on. Um, so whether or not we call it teaching is a matter of definition and so not very interesting because we can define words however we like. But uh, I think that this is really the, the, the engine that cultural transmission works on in humans. And I also think it is not specific to culture. Where does this, this leave me regarding uh, your question? Uh, where does teaching matter to cultural transmission? Well, it depends how we call it. Uh, there is a tendency to call teaching uh, things that to me look like extensive communication. So just, you know, the, the kind of communication humans engage in, which obviously involves language, but is not limited to language. Pointing again qualifies. If people want to say that's teaching, that's fine by me. And if they want to say that teaching in so defined plays a key role in cultural transmission, then that's also fine. Yeah. So another big one, uh, I mean, another big form of cultural transmission people talk about is imitation. And there are anthropologists, developmental psychologists, cognitive psychologists that say that we are compulsive imitators and particularly children are um, over imitate. Is there a good enough evidence for that? <coughs> Well, these are two questions. One is about the evidence for over-imitation, and the other is about its putative role for cultural transmission. If you allow me, I will focus on the, on the second question. Okay. Um, so, rem you, you, you reminded me of this distinction between the wear and tear problem and the flop problem. Mm -hmm. Imitation is typically a, a cognitive mechanism that's supposed to solve the wear and tear problem by making transmission extremely faithful. Uh, you know, A imitates B with high precision, and that means the loss of information between A and B is uh, limited. And mm -hmm. as a result, uh, traditions that are copied through faithful high fidelity imitation uh, last more. In fact, this is neither necessary nor sufficient. Uh, and it's been shown not just by me, but also by models by uh, Magnus and Christ and, and colleagues that one cultural parent uh, makes no culture, regardless of the, the faithfulness of imitation. So faithful imitation helps, all else being equal. It's better to have high fidelity imitation between uh, uh, the source and the target, but it's not sufficient in itself, because if the content is not interesting, uh, if there is no uh, motivation to spread it, if the flop problem is not solved, then this won't, uh, uh, the tradition won't last. And uh, it is uh, not uh, necessary either, because if you have many, many, many ta uh, models to learn from, even if the transmission is not very faithful each time, uh, then you will still have uh, uh, long-lasting cultural uh, traditions. Now, the problem is that people, when I say that, often do not, uh, let me rephrase that. The, the problem with this idea is that it's very hard to distinguish imitation as a cognitive mechanism uh, underlying transmission between two people, and imitation in a much more vague sense that just means cultural transmission. So the way the word is often used in literature is that imitation is cultural transmission. Mm 
There is absolutely no difference between the two. Uh, and cultural diffusion is based on imitation almost by, by definition. Uh, I'm caricaturing, caricaturing this a little bit mm -hmm. uh, because now there's a, a, an entire taxonomy of subsets of uh, uh, imitation emulation and so, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Uh, where, where was I? Uh, sorry, uh, I kind of lost track of my thoughts here. Uh, so you were asking what role imitation plays, and mm -hmm. uh, so about uh, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. And, and and yeah, and I was also I also sort of mentioned that some people claim that we over imitated. I don't know if that will have any bearing on what you yeah. were going to say, but. No, absolutely. Uh, so over-imitation is an intriguing phenomenon where children uh, will imitate gestures that are not relevant, um, not necessary to achieving a technical goal. So they, they imitate in a rather gratuitous way, over and above what is needed uh, to uh, reach a, a given goal. It's an intriguing phenomenon. Uh, what it is not is a cognitive mechanism. We do not know why uh, over-imitation occurs. And people who study it are actually fairly open to the notion that there could be several things that cause uh, over mutation behaviors depending on the context. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we have discovered one cognitive mechanism that is uh, the engine of cultural transmission that would characterize uh, cultural transmission in, in humans as opposed to other animals. I think even people like Andrew Whiten would agree that this is not what these studies show. So to me, it's a phenomenon in search of an explanation, an interesting one, but it is not the answer to uh, the question how traditions get them down. Right. So um, when it comes to conformity, uh, are there specific cases where we follow other people and conform and others where we rely on ourselves and i mean are there criteria <laughs> that people tend to follow to decide on that yes uh, so conformity is not a mechanical uh, rule that we would follow every time uh, yeah. you know thinking you know what am i having for lunch let's look at what other people are having and, and <laughs> follow the majority uh, it never works that way. Uh, so, in fact, the, the notion of conformity, again, is uh, not homogeneous. There are many different interpretations. The dominant interpretation in, in psychology was Solomon Ash's conformity experiment, where uh, a participant in the experiment is confronted by an assembly of uh, subjects who are all confederates of the experimenter. So they are, they are all in on uh, the, the secret of the experiment, which is that everybody is going to give the wrong answer to a very basic factual question. And then they're going to observe whether the participant uh, aligns with the unanimous uh, uh, group uh, by giving the wrong answer to. So here what we have is a unanimity effect, maybe not conformity. Uh, but unanimity. So it's really conforming to the unanimity of participants. Now, in cultural evolution, the way conformity has been uh, uh, conceptualized is more quantitative and frequency dependent on that. It's the notion that the probability that you uh, adopt a cultural trait depends on the frequency of that trait in the population. Mm -hmm. But this is not what the social psychology canonical experiment shows. Uh, because in, in this experiment, it's like 100% uh, versus you know, uh, uh, everybody giving the, the, the right answer. So whether or not people are sensitive to frequency over and above the fact that frequent traits are more easy, easy to encounter, and you're just more likely to pick them up because you're more likely to encounter people that have them, whether we have that sensitivity, that sensitiveness to uh, the trait frequency, is still an empirical question. There are re em uh, experimental results on both sides. Uh, so in, um, in a couple of review papers, one with Hugo Mercier and another with a group of co-authors, including uh, Chris Bazin, uh, Pierre Jacquet, and Alberto Acerli, we consider the, the, the question how good we are at, at integrating different sources of information. Because that's what it boils down to in the end. You have several models. 
that perform a behavior and you have to choose whether or not you are going to imitate them. And if some of them do A and the others do B, you know, how do you how do you weigh uh, those different uh, um, those those different sources uh, of information uh, regarding their number, regarding uh, uh, how uh, independent they are, and regarding uh, also your own opinion about the value of A and B. <clears throat> so the the, the traditional assumption in cultural evolution is that we disproportionately copy the majority. So if it's uh, 51 versus 49, we are like 60% likely to uh, uh, follow the 51%, the, the majority bias, which again is a modeling assumption, very much, uh, quite questionable, empirically speaking. Uh, what we what we found in those two meta-analyses is that, well, it's extremely uh, complicated. Uh, the, the literature is uh, hard to interpret because one key aspect that, uh, that plays an important role uh, and is difficult to control is how independent the sources appear to be. So rationally speaking, if you see five people doing A independently, you should be much more likely to follow them than if they uh, all get the information from the same source. Mm -hmm. Because uh, that's uh, you know, the, the wisdom of crowds effect uh, uh, is at play in the first case, but not in the second. Uh, but it's not clear whether people really do that uh, yet. Mm -hmm. Another thing that is a bit puzzling is uh, how much weight you should put on your own opinion. So if you think that A is objectively better than B, uh, then you, sh you should be more likely to, 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 to go for A as opposed to B. But then again, you might be wrong. And if you have five uh, different people who independently tell you A is better, you should be more likely to follow them than to follow yourself if you have no clue that they are better informed than you are. Uh, and in the cultural evolution literature, it's usually assumed that, yes, people are going to do that. Uh, culture is smarter than you are, the majority is smarter than you are, so why not follow them? But in fact, the experimental literature shows the opposite. So people are uh, irrationally, I argue, uh, more likely to uh, follow their own view, even when they have absolutely no reason to believe they are better than others. Uh, so if I ask you what's the, the height of Mount Everest, and I tell you, well, uh, there's someone else uh, that I know who has answered uh, 9,000 meters, uh, and you, you yourself think it's 7,000, uh, what you should do is to say, well, it's 8,000, let's you know, uh, put the, the, the answer in the middle. But what people do most of the time is they retain their own answer. Uh, they, they, do, they, they do not just uh, uh, um, calibrate their answer with, with other people's. That's not something they should do if they were a rational cultural learner. That, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not the case that people just follow any kind of fad, like uh, no, many people uh, think, right? Absolutely not. No, no, there, there's a... So there's been a couple of uh, successful claims, successful in the sense that uh, there's some lots of books like the, 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 the Folly of Crowds uh, uh, yeah. is a popular thesis. Uh, but when you actually look at uh, fashionable examples of, of the Folly of Crowds, uh, they, they, they are much more rational than they appear to be at first. So uh, in the book I mentioned the Tulip Mania uh, in, in the Netherlands, uh, or, other typical examples uh, that economists, for instance, would use to, 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 to show how gullible uh, people are and how foolishly they follow uh, uh, other people's examples. But when we look at it more deeply, we find that human, uh, you know, discriminated rational choice has a much greater part to play than it appears at first. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us now about the theory of diffusion chains? Yeah, well, that's... I. I pretty much summarized it already. So uh, the, the, the claim I put forward in, in the book, main claim, is that uh, in order for a tradition to spread, it's not enough for uh, transmission between two people to be a strong, faithful, and, and high fidelity. The ch transmission chain has to have a certain shape. Uh, what do I mean by that? In standard uh, diffusion chain experiments since the work of Bartlett in the 1930s, transmission chains are assumed to be linear, so A, B, C, D, E, and so on. Uh, 
uh, such transmission chains are very unlikely to succeed, uh, no matter what. Now, even even if transmission inside them is highly faithful, they are going to uh, peter out because whatever information gets lost at one step in the chain can never be recovered later, so it's irreversible. Mm -hmm. And this irreversibility means that even with a relatively small attrition rate, uh, the information gets lost uh, after a while. Now, how is that solved? Well, it's solved very simply by not having linear transmission chains, but by having chains that branch out uh, and that uh, proliferate. So one very simple way to do that is to have repeated transmission from A to B, but several times. Uh, that already makes up for a lack of fidelity in the uh, mechanisms involved. Another way is to have several models for uh, the same uh, target, which is something that's very important, for instance, for language, uh, where uh, people who study um, the rate of change in words have noticed that uh, word frequency is a key determinant of uh, the rate of change in word phonology, so the most stable words. Uh, that, 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 that stay similar uh, for centuries tend to be also the, the most frequent. And I also noticed that populations where, that are relatively tightly knit, where people speak to all the, the, the same people all the time, tend to preserve odd grammatical features more easily than large, diverse uh, populations, for instance. Uh, and finally, another way uh, to get there is proliferation that is having many, many, many transmission chains, some of which will peter out, but a few of which will succeed. And that is where uh, uh, the flop problem, of course, has to be solved. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the main differences between transmission, transmission chains in the lab and outside it? Well, that, the answer to that question is somewhat different today as it was when I wrote the book, because there's been a lot of progress, I think, in uh, building realistic uh, transmission studies, including uh, some of them in the web. Social networks uh, are a big help for that, but not just social networks. There's been there's more imagination in, in this field, which is normal because there's been a, an explosion in, in the number of uh, publications. So uh, there's lots of ways to build a, a transmission chain. The, the main difference that we cannot uh, yet uh, uh, do anything about between experimental transmission chain and real-life transmission chains is, of course, time. So real-life transmission chains uh, last for centuries, and then there's obviously no way to, to replicate that. So when we study real uh, cultural phenomena, real in the sense that we do not create them, uh, but they're already, they're already there, uh, we are looking at the outcome of, of centuries, sometimes millennia, of transmission. And that's something we really cannot uh, get at in the lab, which is why we need alternative methods like uh, quantitative cultural history or, or models to, to, to investigate that. Yeah. So, um, in the book you say that cultural success has to do with two main ingredients, accessible individuals plus attractive traditions. Could you explain yeah. this? Uh, yes. Um, so the, the, the second ingredient, attractive traditions, uh, is something we already discussed. So if you want a tradition not to peter out, not to flop, the content has to be appealing to, to people. Uh, you know, that's pretty much self-explanatory. Obviously, attractiveness here is a black box which needs to be filled in by uh, appealing to, uh, I would argue, mostly psychological uh, factors, uh, you know, what recipes uh, taste good, what uh, jokes uh, are funny or not, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I won't get into that uh, mm -hmm. uh, right now. The first factor is, more, uh, is less uh, obvious. What I mean by accessibility is simply uh, the fact that you have access to enough people uh, to uh, transmit and sustain a, a given tradition. And that is something that uh, cultural evolutionists have studied very well, and I drew a lot on, on their work uh, in, uh, in the book. Uh, demography is a very important aspect of, of cultural transmission, and it's been realized more and more uh, by people who study... Uh, uh... Sorry, uh, can I go back to that? Um, so accessibility, mm 
uh, accessibility is simply having access to enough people to transmit and sustain a given tradition. Mm -hmm. And here I draw on the excellent work of cultural evolutionists that, for instance, have linked uh, demographic uh, factors with uh, a cultural, uh, well, the capacity of a population to sustain many uh, lasting traditions. Yeah. I think I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about memorability? I think that's a, a term uh, that we haven't touched on yet. What is memorability and does it matter to culture? So let's take this example of the joke uh, that you told me and uh, that uh, I understood <clears throat> again. That joke, I'm going to repeat it, but between the moment where you tell it to me and the moment where I repeat it, a lot of time may have passed. Mm -hmm. And this raises the issue of memorability, of how to store the joke in memory. Uh, and in fact, the first uh, studies on cultural transmission were studies of memory, that, where the impact of uh, cognitive memorability factors was, uh, was key to understanding the durability of traditions. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the big issue behind that was the study of oral tradition. Uh, we know that uh, human populations transmit oral tales, so tales that are spoken or written uh, through generations in a relatively faithful way, uh, and that some populations are capable of incredible feats of memorization. So how is that possible? Well, one answer is that uh, the kind of content that gets transmitted is uh, designed in order to be memorable. And things that you can do to make a story more memorable is, for instance, uh, make it into a poem, uh, versify it, so verses is much more easy, uh, privilege a certain kind of content, uh, for instance, uh, emotional content is more memorable, visually uh, uh, explicit uh, uh, metaphors uh, or descriptions are more mem memorable, and so on and so forth. So there's a beautiful body of work in anthropology and cognitive anthropology concerning the memorability of uh, cultural traditions, uh, which I draw on in the work. On the other hand, memorability is typically a, something that solves the wear and tear problem. It makes a tradition less likely to be lost uh, through uh, information devaluation, but it doesn't solve the fraud problem. So memorability matters, uh, but it's not the only, uh, the only problem that traditions face. Yeah. Uh, we haven't talked about transmission, uh, cult cultural transmission between generations and inside uh -huh. a given generation yet. So, uh, I mean, is it important to distinguish between the two, between transmission inside a generation and between different generations? Yeah, that's been a disputed question uh, since the start of the field. So the, the, one of the first major books on uh, cultural evolution was uh, Cavalli Sforza and Feldman's uh, uh, book in 1979 or 1980, I forgot which, where they argued that the, the first thing to do uh, if we wanted to study uh, cultural transmission scientifically was to distinguish between what they called vertical transmission, which was transmission from parent to child, uh, oblique transmission, which is transmission from uh, anyone to anyone who is not exactly the same age, and what they call the horizontal transmission, which is transmission inside uh, the exact same generation. So in their models, uh, horizontal transmission could occur between people who are individuals who are exactly the same age, uh, which of course is never the case in, uh, in real life. There's always a tiny, uh, at least a tiny little lag and sometimes much more. Um, and they, what they showed was that horizontal transmission cannot stabilize traditions beyond one uh, generation. So it should be relatively ineffectual. And people should learn from their parents. Now, this is very debatable, and, and critics like Boyd Boy and Richardson, for instance, have noticed that very early on. It's very debatable because, uh, again, in real life, uh, horizontal transmission doesn't work that way. You, you, you can have uh, all, all transmission that humans engage in is somewhat oblique. So the, 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 there is always a, a little bit of, uh, uh, of, uh, of an age difference between uh, people who transmit things. And this has important consequences. And, and in the book, I, I, I uh, insist a lot of, on one of them, which is that children have peer-to-peer -peer traditions. Mm 
So uh, games, rhymes, uh, songs uh, that uh, children practice in many, many societies are transmitted mostly from child to child. I'm not talking about nursery rhymes or things that children learn from their parents. I'm talking about riddles and, and games and so on that are uh, in, a, in a very well-documented way transmitted from peer to peer. Uh, and we, we know they are from ethnographic work, but also from uh, uh, folklore work, which is absolutely beautiful on this topic. Uh, so in, in the book, I tried to really measure uh, the, the truth of that. So I, I, I looked at uh, a series of uh, children's games, and for, which are documented from the 16th century, and traced them as far as I could in time. Uh, and inside the document that describes those children's games, there is also a list of adult games. So I could do the comparison. And it is true that uh, children's game lasts at least as, as long as uh, multi-generational games, and actually even longer than adult uh, transmitted games. As, a, as a, a consequence of that is that I think that the, the, the notion that horizontal transmission uh, cannot sustain long-standing tradition is, uh, should be abandoned. Um, this is not a novel idea, again, about the Richardson where, where they are before. Uh, but this also points at uh, a way of looking at culture that takes seriously uh, each generation's own agency, how each generation can reinvent uh, or, or, or transmit on its own uh, a culture that does not necessarily uh, go through uh, this, the usual suspects of uh, cultural transmission, which are uh, prestigious adults. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's also this common idea, perhaps not so much among cultural anthropologists, but perhaps more among lay people, that people that share the same culture, share the same traditions, uh, think about them the same way, interpret them the same way when they're asked to talk, to, to talk about them and explain them, they give the same answer and they think that they represent the same thing in their culture and it, they have the same goals or objectives. It, but is that really the case? Uh, again, I think you answered your own question, yes. Uh, I, I agree that um, Claims of cultural homogeneity uh, are often overstated. Um, as you said, that's something that cultural and social anthropologists nowadays are, are very, very uh, aware of. Uh, and the, some very famous field work uh, has uh, really highlighted the amount of heterogeneity that you can find inside one given population. I, I cite the work of Frederick Barth in this connection with this. He's by no means the, the only ones, the only one. Uh, what I think cultural evolutionists have to do uh, based on that is draw the consequences for uh, what we mean by cultural differences. Uh, as you pointed out earlier, we should be careful about describing difference between populations to cultural differences uh, because Culture is not a monolithic cause of factors that will affect all members of the population in the same way. Uh, so that, that's why the, the book is, in a way, sort of warning against the excesses of, of a, a naive culturalism that would uh, that is exemplified by uh, not so much by anthropology work, but for instance by uh, social psychological work that would uh, explain. Uh, um, differences between populations in terms of uh, an oriental mentality, uh, as in the work of uh, Elizabeth and Wilson. It is a Chinese-Asian frame of mind, and then the Western frame of mind, and it explains all sorts of differences uh, between people. Whenever we can explain differences like that by uh, more reductive, lower level, uh, less grandiose and less cultural causes, I think we should give it a try, and I, I think it works when we try to do that. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that there's good evidence that we have evolved uh, psychological adaptations that are specialized for a culture? Yes, uh, I don't think there's excellent evidence. Uh, I would be somewhat more prudent today than I was in the book on that count. <clears throat> so, the book 
and to start with it, uh, argued that uh, there's no uh, there's no reason to commit to the view that humans have evolved a special faculty for cultural transmission. And what I have in mind when I say that is imitation. So I criticize authors who said that humans have culture because human humans have one uh, genetically uh, hardwired faculty for imitation. Mm. So, like Tomasello or Boyd and Richardson said that uh, at various points in, in their work. Uh, which and, and it's not absurd to, to think that uh, because as you said there's work on over imitations suggesting human uh, imitation is especially faithful uh, because there is uh, mo the, the, the modeling claim that all else being equal faithful transmission makes for longer more stable traditions that, that is also true so it's not a, a straw man nor is it a stupid idea but I do not think that uh, calling for a special domain-specific adaptation uh, that would that would evolve for culture is necessary. The reason I don't think that is because uh, a capacity for communication uh, does all the work that a capacity for imitation would do, and then some. So if you have a capacity to exchange information with others, regardless of whether you imitate or not, regardless of whether the information is cultural or not. Uh, then, what, then what you get out of that is all the benefits of culture plus a, a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, what you, what, the, the reason why communication is better than imitation is that communication does not compel you to imitate in discriminatory or whatever other people do, uh, is that it allows you to, uh, to coordinate and not just do the same thing as others. So if we communicate uh, around a certain task, we uh, may end up doing, uh, you, you doing A and me doing B, and we don't have to imitate each other, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so that the, the basic critique of imitation led me to this claim that there may not be uh, a, a human adaptation to culture. That idea has been caricatured a lot by critics of the book, and uh, who say, well, Morin denies that there is culture. He thinks we are all, uh, it's all, Everything we do is genetically hardwired, and we don't learn, and we don't interact with our environments. I do not think that uh, at all. Uh, I do think we learn. Uh, I do think we are plastic, and we gain a lot of information from each other. But what we do not do is uh, get up in the morning and try to acquire culture and try to imitate people. We communicate with other, we acquire information, and some of that leads to long-standing tradition, and some of that doesn't. But there is no drive to imitate. To put it in the words of Kim Sterling, who reviewed the book, uh, and, and I really like the way he puts it, uh, human culture is driven by mechanisms that are sensitive to content, but indifferent to fidelity. In other words, when I interact with others, I really want to get interesting content, but I do not care whether I'm being faithfully imitating them or not. It's complete opposite of the view based on, uh, for instance, over-imitation studies. Okay, so that's what I said in the book. What I think today uh, is that there could still be some very specific and local adaptations to aspects of culture. And uh, here I'm thinking in particular of language. Uh, so language has been around for a long time, in s under one shape or another. And especially spoken language uh, really requires you to learn uh, larger uh, repertoires of words, and it seems hard for me to accept that this could be purely associationist, and uh, the, 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 the human engine for learning long strings of feelings, uh, long lists of strings of feelings is just too impressive, and there's good developmental psychology evidence for it to be somewhat innate. It's not something that is entirely uncontroversial, so I'm not... Uh, I'm, I'm just keeping an open mind here, and I just want to qualify this idea that there's absolutely zero uh, domain-specific adaptation for culture. There might be in some in some areas. Mm -hmm. That's what I would write today, as opposed to ten years ago. Okay. And since we're talking about evolution, do you have any idea about what could have characterized our first human cultures? <clears throat> That's a tough one. Uh, so in the book, I, I tried to speculate a little bit, but that might have been a bit imprudent. Um, so if we take seriously the view that culture 
is not a block, that is made of a huge number of tiny traditions. Uh, it's quite plausible that uh, we did not become cultural overnight, right? That there was not a, 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 a big transition between a phase with zero traditions and a phase with uh, you know, complete cultural repertoires. So far, so obvious. So we are led to a view of uh, cultural uh, of the evolution towards human cultures, where traditions, uh, the repertoires of traditions, grow and grow and grow, uh, starting from very few traditions, perhaps uh, just a handful related to food processing, for instance, uh, to symbolic culture and and uh, you know, repertoires that grow and grow and grow. Um, this is somewhat at odds with the view that. Humans acquire the capacity to imitate and then they become cultural. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in fact quite opposed to that view because uh, you do not need to have uh, the emergence of the capacity to imitate. You can just make do with uh, information transmission capacities that grow uh, more and more sophisticated over time. Uh, I know this is a huge black box that I just open and close. Uh, and it requires obviously much more uh, work uh, than uh, uh, what I said right now. But if you assume that, you do not need one you know, uh, big jump from an animal that cannot imitate to an animal that can. And you, neither do you need to assume that this animal becomes uh, much more cultural after the shift towards imitation occurs. Uh, what you have instead is a gradual accumulation of traditions where what really matters the most may not be the cognitive capacities of the animal, but could also be its social uh, circumstances and its demography. So uh, I argue for a view of human cultural evolution where uh, the evolution of cognitive capacities that underlie cultural transmission takes second, uh, second place to other factors like social or demographic factor that also play a big role in, in the capacity of human populations to study culture. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take that view, it means that we did not become cultural overnight, but there could also be regressions because demography changes, social structures change, and so the population's capacity to sustain uh, traditions uh, changes as well. So we are not intrinsically, uh, in that sense, a very cultural animal. We, uh, we, we've been more or less cultural in, in various stages of our evolution, and we can all totally imagine uh, Homo sapiens with exactly the same uh, kind of innate cognitive uh, uh, hardwired capacities that we now have, uh, with very, very different uh, cultural um, uh, levels of culture. Hmm. Uh, in the book, uh, I say somewhat provocatively, we can imagine humans without culture, which critics have immediately uh, interpreted as saying, you know, you, again, more denies culture. Uh, he thinks it doesn't exist. There's, it's all hardwired. Uh, again, it's not the, the point I wanted to make. The point I wanted to make was that uh, the basic cognitive makeup of human is not an adaptation, to, is not made of adaptations to culture, and the amount of culture it produces varies a lot depending on, on circumstances. Mm -hmm. And what makes human culture different from the culture of other animals? It is a matter of degree. So I. Uh, I am sympathetic to the view that non-human animals have a traditions after a fashion. So uh, again, a tradition, uh, the way I'm defining this, is, is, uh, is uh, behaviors that get diffused through transmission uh, relatively widely in space or in time or, or, or both. Uh, now, I am sympathetic to the view that non-human animals have traditions in that sense. And I'm relatively uh, relaxed about uh, the issue whether uh, the mechanism that sustains these traditions is really uh, uh, imitation or emulation or whatever. Because again, I don't really think that uh, the amount of faithfulness that occurs during learning is important uh, at all. So I know there's a lot of debate in comparative psychology on that issue, but the book invites us to be much more relaxed than we are and not try too much to, uh, to spend time on the taxonomy of different learning models. No, this is not imitation system, it's enhancement, I don't know what it might be. 
uh, emulation instead and so on. Because at the end of the day, what matters is, uh, is the stability of the traditions themselves. Now, having said that, uh, there is still a fair amount of debate on whether these traditions are cultural at all, meaning that they could be reinvented by individuals in favorable circumstances without any social input. And this would mean that they are not cultural by my definition. Uh, people like Claudio Tenye have been very, uh, have very skillfully defended that idea. So I'm, I'm agnostic about that. I don't, uh, uh, it could lead me to revise my, uh, some of my views about uh, non-human traditions. On the other hand, uh, his argument is uh, about certain uh, ape traditions, not all animal traditions that have been uh, studied. So to answer your question, uh, the difference between human and non-human uh, animals uh, for culture is one of degree. Uh, we do not need to assume that humans have something special in their heads that make them the cultural animal par excellence. Uh, and that would explain the, the, the richness of human cultures. Uh, it's, uh, it's much more gradual than this. Mm -hmm. but, but is culture rare in the animal kingdom? Uh, yes, fairly so. If you consider how many animal species there are and how many genuine accounts uh, of uh, um, cultural behaviors have been found. Uh, again, uh, uh, to me, culture is made of traditions. So mm -hmm. if if a, if a fruit fly imitates the mating behavior of another fruit fly, it's interesting, but it's not culture, uh, because it does not diffuse. I mean, may, maybe it does, but that's an empirical, empirical issue. Uh, so I, I do think it's fairly rare. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, doesn't it have some uh, clear evolutionary advantages? So, and if so, <coughs> why is it that it is so rare? So learning uh, has evolutionary advantages. Learning from others has evolutionary advantages in certain species under uh, certain circumstances. Uh, having uh, long-standing traditions may or may not bring evolutionary advantages depending on uh, how fast the environment changes. That's something that uh, Boyd and Richardson have very convincingly argued. Yeah. Uh, Culture is not for every species. Uh, if you consider the life cycle uh, of humans, it's, it's fairly atypical. You know, we have a slow uh, life history, so to speak, compared to uh, flies, uh, for instance. So I don't think culture is an evolutionary sort of bullet, and, and every animal should have it. Okay. Uh, and what do you think of the concept of cumulative culture, at least as it is usually presented? Well, I don't know how it is usually presented because uh, there's a fair amount of disagreement on how to even uh, operationalize the concept. Uh, the notion of cumulative culture has, uh, um, has had lots of different incarnations. Uh, one of the first ways it was proposed was, was, to, was in order to uh, contrast uh, traits that, are, that, that rely on learning, but that do not form lasting traditions, uh, with genuinely lasting traditions that uh, rely on imitation. Uh, in the 90s, Boyd and Richardson did uh, this paper, why culture is common but cumulative culture is rare. And basically, they, they, they argued that uh, truly lasting traditions only exist in humans because humans imitate. Uh, but today, uh, the notion of community culture is very, very different. Uh, uh, well, at least for some people. And it refers to something like gradual progress. So the capacity to gradually improve on a given tradition through time. And the argument here is that this capacity for gradual progress is somewhat unique uh, or, or uniquely developed in, uh, in humans. That, it's very hard to judge a concept that is so uh, that has so many different interpretations, uh, because you could also uh, apply the idea of cumulative culture to the sheer accumulation of different traditions. So the fact mm -hmm. that uh, reper cultural repertoires can grow, and that's been done to in connection with, uh, for instance, the technological level of societies of different sizes that can sustain more or less 
uh, important technical repertoires. So, bottom line is I don't really know what cumulative culture is. Okay, fair enough. But, uh, okay, so another question. Why are there traditions rather than nothing? And why are there traditions uh, rather than nothing? It's... Uh, ah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to have to think about that one for a while. Um, so the main reason that humans have tradition is because we communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, because we exchange a lot of information. Mm -hmm. The amount of information that becomes cultural, that turns into traditions, is tiny. Uh, and that's why uh, you can have traditions from cognitive mechanisms that are not adapted for uh, transmitting culture. So they are, do not take the shape of imitation, just information transmission, and from that, uh, you get a tiny percentage that turns into long-lasting tradition. Why do they do so? Because they solve what I call the frog problem. Because these uh, practices and ideas that become traditional are uh, interesting enough and uh, in context appealing enough to be transmitted a lot. So the reason why there are traditions is a matter of how many transmission episodes occur. How many times are we uh, motivated to transmit a tradition? So why are traditions so numerous then? Well, depends, because they, have not, they are not always numerous. Uh, in some populations there may be, but in others they might not be. And in past human populations, it could very well have been the case that traditions were not that numerous. So uh, the, the, question, the answer to your question uh, has to be... Uh, has to consider factors like the demography and social structures that make it possible for a population to sustain a large number of traditions. And mm -hmm. I would argue that there is nothing intrins intrinsic in the, the, the human innate baggage and, and genetics uh, that we have many traditions. That, that's not in our genes. There could be uh, humans uh, that have the same cognitive capacities as we do, and have a relatively small number of cultural traditions. Mm -hmm. So with the kind of uh, approach and framework you present in the book, how would you say invention and innovation occur? <clears throat> well, uh, that's, that's tantamount to asking how does behavior work, because innovation is a very broad category that encompasses anything that is not uh, fully uh, learned from someone else. So, why do people behave? Why do people solve problems? Why do they uh, create uh, novel behaviors? That's the general question of cognitive science. I don't think there is a, a productive way of studying innovation uh, on its own without studying cognition and behavior. Mm -hmm. So, going back to the idea that cultures are not monolithic, uh, what does that tell us about the extent to which culture influences human nature? That, because there's a big debate around that. I mean, are we really more psychologically similar or dissimilar, after all? I try to resist the framing uh, that pits nature against culture mm -hmm. um, because it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, take a, a language, for instance. So obviously, well, obviously, nothing's obvious in that area, but uh, humans have some uh, uh, specific skills that are unique to the species that make language learning easier. And we're not even committing to any precise mechanism, but I think everybody agrees it's much easier to, to, to well, not everybody. <laughs> it's, nothing's uncontroversial, but uh, most people would uh, agree that it's much easier to teach a uh, language to, to a human child than to, to most other animals. And now these, uh, and, and for reasons that are not just uh, due to uh, socio-affective factors, like the fact that we interact with babies more. Uh, but also to cognitive factors, so something that's inside people's heads. Uh, 
Now, this innate like, baggage that allows us to uh, acquire language obviously interacts with an enormous cultural input. And I do not uh, agree with the uh, sort of simplistic caricature uh, of uh, um, generative linguistics that would say it's, or, you know, language grows in the mind and is not uh, uh, sensitive to the quality or quantity of the input uh, people receive. But is it really helpful to uh, frame the question that way at like how much is from uh, the social input and how much is, for, is from uh, the cognitive structures? In fact, uh, there, there is a lot of interaction between the two so that the input you get gets transformed and enriched uh, to an enormous extent by your cognitive expectations. Uh, and and there's you know, a mutually beneficial relationship between the two. Uh, so it's like asking uh, whether water or sun uh, makes plants grow. It's just, obviously, both are necessary. But there's no, uh, um, uh, no 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 real sense in which one is more important than, than the other. It's both are limiting factors. Uh, so when two things are limiting factors, asking whether A matters more than B is just uh, uh, not a productive question. And it's especially uh, improductive when it turns into a turf war between... Uh, Anthropology and, and other sciences, where there's some, someone's waving the flag of culture and others are, are waving the flag of uh, uh, nativist views of, of human cognition. So, uh, uh, the book is also an attempt to, to foster a better dialogue between mm. anthropology and, and disciplines like cognitive sciences that, that take human nature more seriously. Uh, I think if we pursue this agenda, it's really important not to reify positions like na nature of culture. Uh, that being said, uh, I do think that if we take seriously the view that cultures are not monolithic at all, but uh, uh, much more individualized, uh, it becomes much harder to uh, push a strongly culturalist agenda that uh, basically uh, sees culture as, uh, as a force that would uh, determine individual behaviors. Uh, because you know, culture uh, it forces you to look at culture as a, a much more distributed, uh, much more atomistic, uh, and much less external force than uh, the view from the 1950s in anthropology, for instance, would, would uh, invite you to do. But then again, I don't think anthropologists are, are doing that much these days, to be entirely fair. Okay. Uh, in modern industrialized societies, do traditions change faster? I don't know. Um, I don't know because it's, answering that question would require us to look, to compare apples with apples. Uh, so, if, if we look at prototypical traditions like, uh, well, like, proverbs or uh, tales or recipes, there is a sense in which you get much more innovation in industrial, industrialized societies because it's just much more people to innovate. But there's also a sense in which you have tools that stabilize traditions for much longer. You have uh, much more content that gets written down, for instance. So I, I wouldn't be able to answer that question, frankly. Okay. So just one last question then, and I think we've already talked a little bit about this at least, but could there be human societies without culture? It's a tough one. Uh, in the book, I, 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 as I said, I was a bit provocative about it. So let's put it this way. Culture is not a, uh, an all or nothing property. Mm. Uh, the, the, uh, again, we, we kind of agreed about that when we discussed uh, the fact that cultures are not monoliths but made of lots of discrete traditions. Uh, given uh, the, e the ease of transmitting some cultural traits and the difficulty of transmitting others, mm -hmm. uh, given the importance of demography and social structures in determining how many traditions you can sustain, it's very likely that uh, how many traditions and how uh, rich a cultural repertoire is varies a lot from one society to, 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 to the next and also from one historical moment to the next. Uh, so 
instead of asking, uh, can a society exist without culture, we could ask how much, how many cultural traditions uh, will be needed to sustain, uh, and which ones will be needed to sustain uh, a population? Uh, and that's an open question, I, I would say. Uh, so, in the book, I try to push back against the idea that we are intrinsically cultural animals, uh, you know, that, that humans have to be cultural in a very strong sense, uh, because it's a way of uh, thinking that prevents us from answering important questions like, uh, what were Homo sapiens like before symbolic culture happens? So before you see uh, evidence for abandoned cave art, funerary ritual, and so on. And not just patchy evidence, but evidence for omnipresence of symbolic culture. We know that the people who were living without uh, are with much less uh, symbolic culture than, than we do. Uh, we are Homo uh, after a fashion. And we, I, I think we should be able to talk about humans without assuming that they are uh, cultural in a strong sense, uh, in the same sense that uh, you know, modern uh, humans with symbolic cultures, uh, burials, um, uh, art, and, and so on, uh, are cultural. So all the humans we know today, of course, are cultural in that fashion, but it may not always have been the case. Um, so, yeah, that, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. So uh, the book is again, How Traditions Live and Die. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Mora, just before we go, where can people find you and your work on the internet? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Oliver with an I. So Oliver with an I, uh, A-N-I. And I also have a, a web page uh, on, the, on the Institute Nico website. And uh, I have a Google page that is oh, just me the URL. I'm just going to try and find it. Uh, but the problem is that I have a very common name and I'm very hard to find on the internet, which I know is a problem. <laughs> it should be something like that. Uh, yeah, so it's like, uh, it's, well, I, I, can, I can send it to you by your chat and you will put the URL on uh, your website. I guess that's the best. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I will be leaving links to that in the description box of the interview. And thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Pleasure was mine. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to help me keep the channel sustainable, please visit my Patreon page or PayPal and consider making a pledge there. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. The show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perugo Larson, Laguerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alec, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Calenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connor, Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gruvoz, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newburger, Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windega, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cabana, Mark Blythe, Roberto Iguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Dugny, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Kassen, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslin Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Eines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hamel, Dable Sloan Wilson, Yasil Adesa Araujo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzka, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, and Todd Shackelford. My producers are Webb, Jim Frank, 
Lucas Staffini, Akian Gilligan, Luís Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardas France, Thomas Trumbull and Nuno Welder, and my executive producers Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all. <laughs>